morning. My name is Nicole Mortis. My partner is Kara Walda. Today we are interviewing Raymond Wilson. He's a veteran of the Vietnam War and the date is November 4th, 2004. Please state your name, rank, and branch of service. My name is Raymond Wilson and I was the Chief Master Sergeant in the United States Air Force. Where were you born? I was born in Batavia, New York, which is down near Buffalo. Were you drafted or did you enlist? Well, actually, when I, I enlisted, and I enlisted because the draft was going very strong at that time, and all of my friends were getting, every day I went to work and somebody had a letter saying greetings. And I didn't want to get drafted. I really didn't want to run around in the jungle carrying a rifle, so uh, I volunteered to enlist in the Air Force, and I wound up going over there anyway, which is okay. <laughs> Where did you enter the service? I entered the service in Buffalo, New York in uh, April of 1966. How did your parents feel about your decision? Well, they, my dad was a World War II veteran, so uh, he really didn't say anything. My, my mom was very concerned, but she also understood because that was the, the, the way it was going on during the time is that I mean, if you didn't volunteer, you'd be drafted, and then when you were drafted, you were at their mercy. So I had a little bit more control on my destiny. Where were you sent? I first went to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas for basic training, and after that I went to Lowry Air Force Base in Colorado for my technical training uh, in, in preparation for, to be a munitions specialist. After that, my first assignment I picked out of a hat, which was Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii, and <clears throat> the guys at Lowry chased me across the drill pad. They wanted to pound me into the ground because I got Hawaii and they got Turkey and Korea and stuff like that. But uh, after that, I went to, I was only there eight months, and I was sent to Thailand for two months. I returned from Thailand, and a week later I was in Thailand again for a year. Then I went from Thailand to Lackland, Texas again, only this time I was what they call permanent party. I was actually assigned there, working in the ammunition storage area. I was there four months, and I got sent back to Thailand again for another year. So I got to see Bob Hope twice, which is really cool. Um, after, that, after that, I was discharged from the service. I got out in 1969, and I spent until February of 71. I had nothing to do with the military. In February of 71, I joined the Air National Guard in Niagara Falls, and I was in there for four months when I went back on active duty. And I went to Magdill Air Force Base in Florida, and I was out there 14 months. Then they sent me to Inzalik Air Base, Turkey, for two years. I returned to Lowry Air Force Base in Colorado for a tour of duty as a military instructor. I was an instructor in our technical school for two years. After that, I was assigned to the Strategic Air, for the Strategic Air Command Headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska, as a maintenance, standardization, and evaluation team inspector. And, uh, I was there for three years. When I finished there, I was sent to Korea for a year. When I, when I left there, I came right here to Rome, New York, Griffiths Air Force Base, and I uh, helped to bed down the cruise missiles, the first ones we ever had in the Air Force right here. I left here in 82, and I went to Hickam Air Force Base again in Hawaii as a member of the Pacific Air Force's Inspector General Team. And we were tasked to inspect all of the combat units in the Pacific, make sure they were ready to do their job in case they had to. So I was hardly ever in Hawaii. I was in Japan, Korea, all over the place over there. I was there for almost two years. Actually, I was there two years. And then uh, I was sent to the Philippines, where I spent four years. And I returned to Griffiths from there in 1988. And I retired from Griffiths Air Force Base in 1994. <laughs> um, what was your personal view on the war in Vietnam? I, I was kind of uh, non-committal at first until I went to Thailand. And I, the base I was at was right on the border of Thailand and Laos. And there was only about 800 people there. The roads were all dirt. It was like an outpost almost. All of our aircraft were uh, World War II aircraft, so like stepping off into the twilight zone. But I saw things there that 
the communists did to the people that the people of the United States didn't hear about because the media unfortunately was very biased back then and they didn't tell the whole story to the people back here in the, in the United States about what really happened over there. And I was in Thailand and I saw some nasty things downtown where uh, what they did to uh, tribes, or not the tribes, but the villagers when they wouldn't support the communists and things like that. So it was kind of uh, enlightening to me. Uh, my mom called me a warmonger when I came back because she didn't understand, but I sat down and talked to her about it and, and I told her to go talk to my friend who just came back from Vietnam, but he wouldn't talk about it because he saw some ugly stuff. So she kind of slowly changed her, her tune and everything and uh, she realized that I wasn't a warmonger, but uh, yeah, I've seen things that, you know, that people in the States didn't see or didn't understand. So my outlook, or my, uh, my concept about the war, or my thoughts about the war back then, I'll, I supported it because I thought we needed to help those people over there to uh, give them their freedom, because they didn't have freedom. And the, when the communists came in, they just took their freedoms away from them. All right. So when you were in Thailand, what were your duties? My duties in Thailand, um, I was a munitions specialist, so what that meant was I used to receive the munitions that they came in from the state. We would store them. Um, I also worked in maintenance, which meant that we used to assemble all the munitions. So bombs, when they come in, they come in pieces. So you can take a bomb body and you can make different things out of it. Well, we used to take the bomb bodies and put them all together. There's about 29 pieces to make up what they call a dumb bomb. And it's quite, quite involved and you have to do a lot of planning. It's like a manufacturing operation almost. You have to get all your parts together and you have to figure out a system. And we used to do that. And a lot of the ordinance we had in, in Nakhon Phanam, which is the base of it near Laos, was old World War II ammunition. And some of it was just really junky and hard to work with. And they didn't teach us that in the technical school. I mean, we just had to learn how to do it. Right. And um, that's what we used to do. We used to support the combat aircraft we had on the base. Um, on your information sheet, you said that you assembled, received, and transported all ordinances for combat missions on. And they listed all these aircrafts, A1, A26, T28, A1, O2, and OA-10 aircraft. What are those? <laughs> Those are, <clears throat> pardon me, the, any aircraft that starts out with an A, that's an attack aircraft. And all those aircraft I mentioned were all propeller driven. So uh, anybody who was sitting in the States that was at a fighter base, they had jets. When I got off the plane at Nakhon Phanam, it was raining, everything was mud. Uh, the ramp was PSP, which is perforated steel plating. Those don't cut, no paved roads. And I looked around and all the aircraft had propellers on and I thought it was just like stepping off in the twilight zone. I was back in history and uh, that was the nature of our, our mission. We were uh, an air commando wing, so we did special operations, that's what we did. And uh, it was very interesting, I really enjoyed it, I mean it was, it was something different and uh, when we got the A1s, the A1s came in, um, we had a squadron that came from Vietnam, our workload went way up. And when I returned to Thailand in 1968, in December 68, I went back to the same base that I had just left. And we had a whole group of those A1s out there, I think it was three squadrons. So our workload was like huge, really huge. But everybody worked together as a team and, and we did a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of missions to rescue down pilots. That was our secondary mission. If a pilot went down, we had four aircraft on alert called the Sandys, and they would go out. And if they called back and said they needed help, the whole wing stopped what they were doing. All, all the ordnance was taken off the aircraft, and special ordnance was put up, and we went out to support them to get the pilot out. We, we were involved in missions sometimes. I remember staying out there for three days, never left work. We were out there for three days. We slept out there, everything. And they used to bring us food, say, here's your food boxes of seat rations, which is kind of gross, <laughs> but that's what we, we had to do, and uh, we'd get the pilots out, and the pilots, when they were rescued, they were, you just can't imagine how happy they were to have someone yeah. come get them. 
Were you ever in combat or under fire? Only one time I flew a combat mission in a, in a C-123 aircraft dropping flares over Laos. <clears throat> and the mission lasted from midnight until 6 in the morning, so dark. And as soon as we took off, all you see was fires burning. That was over Laos. So we flew over there and they explained to me what to look for for anti-aircraft because there's like three or four different kinds. Mm -hmm. You could tell by the, the uh, tracers that were going up past the aircraft what they were. So I didn't think too much of that until I saw the tracers go flying up past the tail. And then it was like reality set in and it was like, oh my God, because there's no place to hide when you're up in the air. And I got really sick to my stomach. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really sick. So it made me sit down for a while, and I was I was okay after that. But it was it was very scary. I only went one time. I wanted to try to see what it was like, and uh, I didn't have to do it. And the reason I didn't do it anymore was they wouldn't give me time off of work. So I worked all day, then went took a nap, flew all night basically, and I had to be at work at seven seven o'clock in the morning the next day. So it was kind of rough. So yes. I didn't do it anymore. You didn't do that very often. Um, did you ever receive any battle wounds or any of your friends receive any wounds? Okay. Uh, no. No, I didn't. What was your unit like and did everyone get along? The unit I was in was a munitions maintenance squadron. And we had two distinct groups. <clears throat> we had the bomb dump group, which is where I was at. And then we had the guys that loaded the bombs on the aircraft, the loaders. And it was always a friendly rivalry between the loaders and the bomb dump. I mean, that's everywhere in the Air Force. And to this day, it's, it's still alive and well. It's a friendly rivalry that uh, they always jab at each other, but when the mission came, when it came down to the mission, everybody worked right together. That came into play here at Griffiths during Desert Storm. I was the superintendent of the munitions maintenance squadron here, and we had a load. Uh, two primary B-52 loads and one spare, so it was like three full aircraft with bombs. We didn't have any bombs. And we had to have them loaded by 9 o'clock on Monday morning, ready to go. The bombs came in the gate, right here by RFA, on top of hill up here. They came through the gate at 9 o'clock Sunday night. So we had to take them out to our holding area and bring them in the storage area a little bit of time. So we had to orchestrate this big plan. And I was very proud of the the men and women in our squadron because they all work together like a team. In fact, my commander commented when uh, he heard the radio traffic, the loaders already had their the B-52s configured so they were standing by waiting for the munitions to come out. And they called out to ask if the guys needed any help, if they could bring them any equipment. And my commander looked at me and said, is this the same squadron? Because <laughs> there's always this rivalry. You know? But they came out and watched the assembly of the bombs and actually they tried it themselves to see what it was like. And, wow, this is hard. So they got a better uh, perspective on what each person did. And then when they started loading, we took the people from the storage area that built them out to the flight line and let them watch. And they were, uh, got a better pers perspective of what those guys did. So it made a squadron stronger. And we used to do that too in, in Thailand too. There's always this little rivalry, but everybody worked real good together. So after coming from America, what was it like living in Thailand? Well, it was like a major culture shock because when you uh, go downtown, when we went downtown in Thailand, for example, the way you went downtown was you got in the little, the little Datsun pickup truck, they had a little cover on the back, they call it the bot bus, because the, the money is the bot. So it cost you a bot, which was a nickel, to ride downtown. And you had to climb in the back, and they, they cram as many people as they could in this truck. And that's in the truck, it will, the guys get fired up on beer or whatever downtown, and they stand on the back bumper and bounce up and down, and they lift the wheels right off the road, and <laughs> the guys get mad at us, you know. But uh, you see stuff like that, and then there's always somebody there trying to rip you off. Because that's the nature of the, I mean, they're poor people too, so. But you got to see how they live too, and, and they were they're very poor people for the most part, and uh, they're very, very good workers. The Thai people were absolutely excellent. Their, their uh, work ethics were, was great. They hated, hated communism, and uh, they really supported what we were trying to do. And I, I really enjoyed being over there. I enjoyed the food, it was excellent, mm -hmm. all the fruit, and uh, 
I used to eat all the fresh and bring back to the base, and everybody thought, what is that? Because we're looking, some of the fruit is weird looking, but very, very delicious. And their food's good too. So I really <laughs> liked it there. Did you receive any medals, honors, or awards? In my career, I received, well, let's see. I, I have them on my, my flag you board here. Show it? Sure, my flag board right here. Um, this one on the top is kind of a maroon looking one. That's a meritorious service medal. And I received I received six of those in my career. That's a quite a high honor. Uh, the one next to it, the yellow and blue, that's Air Force uh, Commendation Medal. And I received five of those. So um, <laughs> I know they'll count, they give you points toward promotion too when you came up eligible for promotion. So that was a good deal. Uh, these other ribbons here, uh, there's medals on the National Defense Medal, which everybody got. A lot of these things, a lot of people got those. Um, there's Air Force Marksman ribbon there with a device on it because I qualified expert with an M16 and a, and a handgun and pistol. Um, the ones on the bottom, the, on the, the green and white over there, that's the Vietnam. Cross of Gallantry. This is Vietnam Cross, Cross of Gallantry. This one here is the Vietnam Campaign Medal. And then the yellow one up here is the Vietnam Service Ribbon and a medal too. And it's got seven battle stars on it. It means I was there for seven different campaigns in support of the operation. And, and then um, those little badges, like in the middle, those just represent what teams you were on? This here is when I retired from Griffiths, they gave me this flag box. I remember in my service here, they flew this, this flag was flown over Washington, D.C. in a B-52. It's pretty cool. And this, this one here is the uh, command emblem for the Air Combat Command, which Griffiths became part of. And this one over here is the Strategic Air Command, which was dissolved and became the Air Combat, part of the Air Combat Command. So they put both of those on there because I was here for both of that. And then that on the left, my left, that was off here. That's my rank. Uh, the, this, this is the old Chevron, as they call it. Now this rank has three stripes on top, and there's one less on the bottom. They kind of move them around a little bit. This is the old, the old rank emblem, and uh, I still relate to this one. <laughs> <laughs> I held this rank for ten years. I'm very proud of that. Cool. Very cool. You want to get the picture too right now? What are we Zoom on. Mr. Wilson when he was how old? Eighteen. Well, Eighteen years old. <laughs> I can see the resemblance. <laughs> In fact, uh, those people at our house one day when my son was home and they were studying, and one young lady asked him if that was his brother. <laughs> he was my dad, so she was embarrassed. But <laughs> All right. I understand that you met General Colin Powell. What was that like? I met General Powell here at Griffiths. He, his plane got diverted here because of a weather problem down in Washington, D.C. And I had the opportunity to meet him. And that was after Desert Storm. That was awesome. He's uh, very smart, very articulate, and uh, I, got, I had some of my, of my uh, workers come out there too, so they got to meet him too. And it was very, it was a very uh, awesome experience. I'll never forget. Um, what and who do you remember best from your service, and why? Well, I remember one chief master sergeant, which is the same as me, but when I was younger, younger, his name was Paul Killian. We just call him Papa K. He was the most obstinate, hard-headed, old brown shoe, as we call him, guy. He was very, very strict. Um, he demanded perfection in your job, which I had no problem with. And I had no problem with, with him at all. Um, I learned a lot from him, and I worked for him in Korea. Uh, I, he, was, he was a chief. He was our, our chief in the squadron, and I was a I was a master sergeant at that time, and uh, he was tough, but he gave me jobs. He gave me a job when I first got there. He wanted me to fix this one area, 
I had never worked there before in my life. But we got to fix it. It took two months, but we got to fix it. And then he moved me to this other, other shop. It was really messed up. It took me six months to fix that. But he was always there, always supportive. And uh, he always told me, never forget where you came from. And I always passed that on to the younger guys, too, because sometimes people want to get in elevated levels of uh, responsibility. They forget what it was like when they were down in the trenches. Right. So I used to tell the uh, young guys and gals here when they made sergeant that, uh, remember that the worst boss you ever had in your life, don't be like that person. And don't forget where you came from. That's good advice. How were you treated when you returned home from your service after the Vietnam War? Not real good. I came home in 1968 and I was happy to be home. It was America, yes. And I was spit on in San Francisco, called a baby killer. Um, I got back to my hometown, which is down near Buffalo. I was kind of bored because it was nothing to do. So I wound up in the uh, <clears throat> local gin mill on a Friday night and found out that four of my friends were there. They just came back from, from Vietnam also. Uh, three of them were Marines, one was in the Army. Of course, I was a lonely Air Force guy. I busted my chops about that, but we had a good time. And uh, some guys came into the bar. We didn't know who they were. They were from somewhere else. They walked up to my friend that was in the Army, who was also an American Indian, and they, they told him, nice haircut, Cochise. And I turned around and said, hey, what's your problem? Well, and I got smacked and knocked off the bar stool. So we had this big brawl in the bar, and those guys got chunked out the door because those guys were totally ballistic, my friend. And uh, that was the end of that. But it was a very confusing time. I couldn't figure out what the heck is going on. And, uh, it was very, it was a very bad part of it. Uh, it was very bad for anybody that's in uniform because a lot of people looked at you like you were no good. Mm -hmm. Not everybody, but there was some. In fact, it was quite a few. It was kind of tough, and I'm glad it's changed around. It's just the opposite now. Why did you choose to remain in the Air Force and make that your career? Well, I always liked it when I. When I first went to the Air Force, I did it just because I wanted to get that commitment done. But as I worked at it, I said, man, this is really nice. But uh, I got out in 1969 because everybody was getting out. That was like the thing to do. Plus, I'd been to Southeast Asia three times, once temporary duty and twice per, for two full tours in my first four years. And I figured the handwriting was on the wall. If I stayed in, I'd be back ordered again. I said, wow. So I decided to get out see what it was like on the outside. And for the first 30 days, it was like I was on leave because, yeah, you know, it's like when you're on leave, you have a good time and everything. Well, then Mary Alsey said, and I was like, wow, okay. I'm working every day. And, and I came home on a Wednesday. I was discharged on a Wednesday. Or I got home on a Wednesday, pardon me. Um, Thursday, I got my job back. Friday, I bought a car. Monday, I started work. So I didn't put any grass growing on my feet. So I was working in the, my, the factory where we used to work. It was okay, but I got bored, you know, and I missed the uh, military life because uh, it's very organized, very organized. And uh, I really enjoyed it. So that's why I joined the National Guard in 1971. And sub subsequently went back and active duty in, in July of 71, and I, and I stayed for the remainder of my tour, which wanted to be 26 years. <laughs> it's a long one. So you said you were a member of the Strategic Air Command Standard Standardization and Evaluation Team and the Pacific Air Force's Inspector General Team. What were each of those teams and what did you do as a member? Okay, the, the SAC MSET team, the, the Maintenance Standardization Evaluation Team, what that was was aircraft maintenance, munitions maintenance, that we would go out to the bomb wings and we would inspect their maintenance, how well they did maintenance on their aircraft and also on their munitions, munitions systems, things like that. When I first went out there, first of all I went there because 
my other option was to go to Korea. And I said, hmm, well, if I go to this job here, this is like one of those square fillers you fill if you want to make uh, rank later on in your career, higher rank. They, they want you to have like a staff job somewhere, and that was a staff job. So I went, and I made master sergeant there, which was good. We changed the way the uh, command looked at the munitions people. I was conventional munitions. What the guy told me when I first got there was, he said, you got to remember they failed until they prove themselves past. I told him I didn't believe in that because as far as I'm concerned, they're past until they prove themselves fail. So we didn't. You know, we had a little bit fugly there. <laughs> but he retired, which was good because he needed to go. And a guy I used to work with in Thailand came up and, to help me. And we both had the same philosophy about how to do our job. And as a result, the first year I was there, most of the units were failed or they were marginal. And then the second year, they were getting better. Then the last year, other the third year, it was hard to find anybody who failed at all. They just changed right around because we were providing help, and they knew we weren't there to mess them over. We were there to help them, even though we had a right down with them, things wrong, but that's to help them get better. And then when I went to Hawaii, I was on the Pacific Air Force's Inspector General team. Basically, a similar type of job. We had to make sure that the the units out there were ready to do their combat missions. And we would go out there and actually task them like they were going to war. And we watched them get their aircraft ready, load their aircraft. And my job was I had to, go, I had to make sure that the munitions were, one, assembled properly, two, they had enough, and they had the procedures in place so they knew how to resupply themselves. And uh, same thing there. They got better and better and better, which was good. And our IG team in Hawaii was, was ranked the best IG team in the Air Force for two years in a row. So that was really an accomplishment. I really, I really enjoyed it there. Would you support your children and future grandchildren's decision to join the service, and why? Yes, I would, because I feel that uh, as an American, you have an obligation to support and serve your country somehow. Now, some, people, some people serve different ways. Peace Corps, that's fine. But, uh, if they want to do that, that'd be okay with me too. But uh, if they want to go in the military, it's fine. Uh, my son Doug right now is uh, he's a member of the Air Force ROTC. He attached me at Clarkson University, and when he graduates, he'll be a second lieutenant. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Last question: What do you think about the war in Iraq? Well, that's a pretty controversial subject, and uh, I can understand why we went there. I was a little concerned at first, because I didn't think he'd catch Saddam Hussein, because he's pretty slick, but they caught him, got his sons. That's good, because he, he was a very vicious person, very bad tyrant over there. And I just hope that, uh, that we can get a handle on these insurgents that are over there. Because I don't believe that they're the Iraqis that are doing this. I think it's people from outside stirring up the problems. And uh, no, we started a job, we have to finish it. The difference between this one and, and Vietnam, in Vietnam, the, the military commanders did not have control of the battlefield. The targets were picked by politicians in Washington. They used to have breakfast to decide what they were going to bomb. So as a result, the generals were all sitting there going, <laughs> Okay, what are we going to do? You know, they're waiting for the words of what they were supposed to do instead of them picking it themselves, like happened there in Desert Storm. General Schwarzkopf was given the green light, do what you got to do. Right. It worked. So, um, I, I support what we're doing there. I hope we can get it cleaned up fast. And I, I really hope we can find Osama bin Laden because he's a real bad guy. If we can find him, that'd be good. I hope that we could get the world back. To in a peaceful mode again. And do you want to just um, explain the scarf? Sure. The this is a, this is a scarf that fighter pilots fighter pilots all have a scarf, and they're all different. This belonged to a major Sosa in the Philippines. He was an F four pilot. I used to work with them very closely because we used to issue all of their munitions to them for their training. And he was responsible for their account, which was really messed up. So we worked with them real close to get it all squared away. And 
he gave this to me when I left the Philippines. <clears throat> and for a fighter pilot to give you his scarf is like a, a very big honor. So I've kept this and I will always keep it. Thank you very much. Cool. You're welcome.